Let's get started. Um, welcome to the Victorian age of JavaScript. And thank you all for coming on a Friday. I know it's the afternoon, and I know things are winding down, so I really appreciate everybody coming here. Um, so what am I talking about when I'm talking about the Victorian age of JavaScript? What does that mean? Well, I was thinking about JavaScript and how it's moving very quickly, right? There's new frameworks all the time. It's almost too much to keep up with or assimilate. And there were some parallels in my mind between that and kind of what happened with medicine 150 years ago in the Victorian era, right? Um, there's loads of new treatments back then, right? They were coming out with new ideas all the time about how to like, sort of cure disease. Um, JavaScript has a similar situation right now. There's loads of frameworks, build tools, package managers, all kinds of things. Um, and within all of those new ideas, there are some real advancements, right? We've got fat arrow syntax now. We can actually do string templating 20 years after JavaScript was developed, right? That's awesome. Um, we have consts now, so we can actually set a variable and say, I don't want it to mutate. That's great. But like medicine, there's limited regulation or oversight that, that this time in JavaScript right now. Anyone can start a GitHub repo. Anyone can start um, a new framework and say it is the best thing ever, right? Like Victorian era medicine, charlatans are peddling dangerous drugs, right? We've got all kinds of frameworks out there. JavaScript Weekly is talking about new things all of the time. And in some cases, the cure can be worse than the, worse than the disease. Um, for example, everyone right now wants to use single page applications, single page applications for everything. Um, when in fact, that's not always the right choice. I um, mean, some of these treatments actually literally can kill people, um, like Angular 2, for example. Um, and it's not entirely fair. There's probably some people here that really like Angular 2. Um, and it's, it's not actually going to kill you, right? That's not, that's not my intent. Um, but Angular 2 is, is kind of a, one of those examples of a framework that I think is a, a good example of the problem that we're seeing with too much new ideas in JavaScript. So who am I? Uh, my name is Eric Brandis. I'm the co-founder of TrackJS, which is a JavaScript error monitoring tool. Um, we've got an ex exhibition booth um, out in the expo hall. So if I say something that really offends you, uh, feel free to uh, come yell at me afterwards. Um, I also am a consultant. Uh, so I spend a lot of time doing advanced front-end development for big Fortune 500 companies. Um, so I've kind of seen both sides of this JavaScript world. I've used a lot of these advanced new frameworks, um, and then I've seen how they break. And a lot of them do break, and uh, it's not clear that they're actually adding value. So like Victorian era medicine, um, there were some good ideas back then. Uh, for example, the smallpox vaccine, right? I think everybody here would agree that that was a pretty good idea, saved several million people, hundreds of millions of people probably. And so we've got similar ideas with JavaScript, right? I think everybody realizes that bundling and minification is a good idea, right? We take all of our disparate scripts, we put them in one to save on the requests. We minify them to save the bytes over the wire so the scripts load faster and the user experiences the web page faster. It's a good idea. Um, one of the other advancements in JavaScript that I think most people would agree is a good one, we're starting to get sane modules. So at first, JavaScript was kind of the Wild West. We didn't really know how to like, block up our code. We didn't really know how to like, distribute it, how to actually make real applications with it. Um, it started with advanced or asynchronous module definition, right? Um, we had to work within the framework of ES5. But then came Node and CommonJS. And people were like, well, that's actually a pretty good idea. Um, and now with ES6, we've actually got a, a fully specced out module uh, framework, import, export, all those kinds of things. Um, there's an asterisk on this slide, though. The reason for the asterisk is because the ES6 team didn't actually fully think out the spec. And it turns out that they can't actually know if something is a module in a performant way just from that import syntax. So now they're actually advocating that we add an MJS file extension uh, to any module JavaScript. So, that's still in, in play. Um, nobody's really figured out what's going to happen with that. Um, but we are starting to see some, some module rationality. We've got new language features. We've got const, right? We've got fat arrow functions. Um, we've got string templates. So these are all good things. But like Victorian era medicine, there are some bad things. So back in the day, people thought it was a good idea to drill holes in your skull. It's called trepanation, all right? We don't think that's a good idea anymore. Um, some things that I think are similar, some things that I think are here today but are going to be the trepanation of tomorrow are things like destructuring, particularly nested destructuring. Does anyone know what the actual output of this is? There's a variable called first that has a name of Eric or it has a string value of Eric. 
But if I actually caught someone using that code, I would be pretty upset because it is not immediately clear what is going on. The same thing exists with the new spread operator. So it's very easy to write code that is obtuse, that is difficult to maintain, that is difficult to understand. And what's worse is we do have a spec now. There's an ECMAScript TC39 committee whose job is to actually push the language forward. The problem is they think that they need to push the language forward with new syntax all the time. And so they get proposals like this. This is the straw man bind operator proposal. Um, basically, we've already got a bind function, right, that will take uh, whatever you pass in and make it the context of the function, the this value, right? Because everyone knows in JavaScript, this is one of those landmines that you always have to be very careful about. So they decided that the bind function was maybe a little bit too verbose. So instead they decided they wanted to C++ify the language a little bit with two colons, for example. Um, this has not been ratified, but this is the kind of stuff that people are thinking about. This is what people consider progress in JavaScript. And I guess my stance on it is somewhat measured. Um, another example is frameworks in terms of things that aren't really going, I don't think they're going to be good ideas five years from now. And one of those is Angular. Um, I was going to say Angular 2. Are you guys familiar with Angular 2? Have you heard of Angular 2? Um, did you know it's actually called Angular 4 now? Um, or will be in a few weeks? So they decided that Angular 2 uh, was good, but they wanted to go to Semver. And so they decided that we want to be able to make breaking changes and communicate those. And so that requires a new major version. So you might think, well, the next version of Angular would probably be 3, right? We go from 2 to 3. But they, that didn't happen either because actually it turns out Angular Router was already on major version 3. And so they said, well, we can't have, you know, we can't go back in time with that. So we'll just standardize on 4. And now they're saying that every six months they are going to release a new major version with breaking changes of Angular 2. Um, I actually got into a big argument on Twitter with these guys about that. And I said, you guys are nuts. Like the upgrade treadmill here is way too fast. People don't want to be upgrading every six months with breaking changes to their app. And they said, nope, too bad. That's how we're going to do it. Semver lets us do it, and that's the way it's going to be. So let's talk a little bit more about Angular 2 or 4 or Angular. I think it's just Angular now, they want to call it, which is interesting to me because there's already Angular 1. So if you're like, well, I work on an Angular app. Is it a just Angular app, or is it an Angular 1 app, or is it an Angular Next app, or is it an Angular 7 app? I don't know. It's confusing. It's hard to tell. And they're not even very similar. Angular 1 is very different than Angular 2, right? So there's a lot of confusion here. So this is the output of the Angular 2 quick start. So if you actually go to GitHub, get the quick start, like the blessed official quick start for Angular 2, if you pull it, npm install, npm start, this is what comes up. It's essentially an H1 that says, hello, Angular, right? So it seems pretty simple. It's a great base to start from. The problem is, if you actually look at node modules, you've got 108 megabytes of files in your node modules just to put hello, Angular on the page. You've got 13,740 files that actually help to do this. This is what the top level of your folder structure looks like in the, in the uh, editor. You can see we've got system.js config, extras.js, protractor config, karma, conf, all this stuff, right? Is this really all necessary to put an H1 on the page? Here's the component itself, right? At first, it seems pretty simple. And, and in fact, this component is pretty simple. Um, but you might notice the at component syntax. That's a new TypeScript attribute thing that Angular 2 makes use of heavily. Um, you'll notice the template is a string. So, We've come all this way. We've got 108 megabytes of node modules. We've got 13,000 files to do this. And we're still actually writing template strings, right? And so you've got no tooling help. You've got almost nothing if you screw up. When we actually request this page, and granted, this is dev. This is not production mode Angular 2. When we actually request the page, it's 39 requests to put that H1 on the page. It's 2.2 megabytes of script that gets transferred just for that. So. My thesis is that this is too much. This is too complicated. This is a bad idea, right? How did we get here? What, like, what, like, what happened where we actually are thinking that Angular 2 is a reasonable solution to our problems? Well, like medicine and the history of medicine, the early web was basically religious rit rituals based on paganism, right? If you look at, like, for example, Amazon.com's original homepage, right? It looks pretty nasty. It's, it's static. It's boring, right? If you want to do any kind of like dynamic work, you're actually doing a full 
form post, right? So we didn't have JavaScript back in the day. You probably had some Perl sitting in like a CGI bin gateway, and it was taking in form input params, right? And that worked okay, right? But eventually people wanted more. They wanted some kind of dynamic scripting language on the page. So just like medicine, um, we've got kind of this, this emergence of a new technology, right? Nobody's really standardizing on it. Nobody really knows what's going on. Um, one of the first things that you could do with JavaScript, you could actually change the status bar on your browser. Does anyone remember the days of like you'd hover over a link and it would say something awesome, like click here for cool stuff, and then you actually had no idea where it was going to take you, right? Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't actually work anymore. Um, we had some frameworks come out of this. People said, well, we should probably do something um, to kind of standardize some of this. And we had Scriptaculous, we had Prototype, we had Moo Tools. There were several others at this time, right? Um, and these are all pretty good frameworks. And actually, for those that remember, Prototype came well before jQuery. Um, as this stuff went on, JavaScript started to be more mainstream, right? People started running their browsers with JavaScript turned on all the time. Um, similar to medicine, this was kind of the rise of science and study, right? We started to say, okay, JavaScript's here to stay. We need to actually kind of put some regulation, some oversight around this. And one of the people that actually really pushed the ball forward was Microsoft, believe it or not. Um, the original XML HTTP request was an ActiveX object, but it was actually created for Outlook web app. And so you could actually, so the, the great folks at Microsoft said, hey, we don't want to do a full page post all the time. Sometimes we want to actually get some data out of band, right? And then draw it in the page, and it's kind of a very seamless app-like experience. So for those that didn't know, Microsoft actually is the inventor of Ajax, which is kind of cool. We also saw that jQuery sort of won the framework war. So um, there were many competing. There was Dojo. There was all these things. The Ajax Control Toolkit. Do people remember that from Microsoft? That was kind of a sad day, wasn't it? Um, but jQuery sort of won the war. Um, we can do that same Angular 2 example that took 108 megabytes of node modules and 13,000 files. We can actually do that same thing with jQuery with this one line of code, right? Now, that's too simplistic, right? The Angular 2 example is doing more, um, and this is the road to a very bad place, right, if you just start doing DOM manipulation like this. But this jQuery stuff got people thinking. It got them thinking about client-side rendering. Um, which I would kind of call the renaissance in, in web development terms. We had frameworks like Knockout, right? Do you guys remember Knockout? It's kind of the first MVVM thing built by Steve Sanderson. Um, it wasn't exactly a single page application framework, but it was getting there. Um, and it led the way to Backbone JS, right? So Backbone came out and everyone's like, oh, this is cool. We've actually got structure for our JavaScript now, right? We actually can put these things in different places. There's kind of a prescribed method to do event delegation, to do rendering, that kind of thing. And people actually started, at this point, building full-on single-page applications where you would load a metric ton of JavaScript and you would never have to leave the page for a full-page load again. But unfortunately, like all good things, uh, it had to come to an end. And so now we're in what I would call the Victorian age of JavaScript, um, or JavaScript fatigue, right? And so this is a, a term that actually has come out in the last few months. Um, and essentially, it's talking about this. It's talking about the fact that there are, I mean, I Googled for five minutes to get that list of images, right? Like if I thought about it longer, I could probably come up with several hundred frameworks, um, you know, 15 different build tools and all that. And so how do we make sense of all this? How do we know what's good? How do we know what's bad? How do we know like if I take this tool, is my client going to kill me when I don't deliver the software on time or when it's super buggy, right? Um, so the rest of this talk, I kind of want to talk about some good ideas and some bad ideas that's kind of already existing in the JavaScript landscape today. I kind of want to talk about um, how you can avoid the landmines and pick the tools that I think are going to last into the future. So the first thing that you need to decide when you're building a web application is how are you going to render this thing? Um, so everybody right now is saying that single page applications are kind of the way. And I'm here to tell you I don't think that's true at all. Um, just like lobotomies were a bad idea back in Victorian era medicine, uh, single page applications for everything is a really, really bad idea right now. Um, your app, in my mind, is probably not Gmail, right? You probably don't need that level of interactivity. It's probably not a to-do list, right? Because this is the classic sort of hello world for your average MVC JavaScript framework, right? It's probably not that either. It probably looks more like this, right? It's probably a line of business app, or it's probably something very complicated, um, doing some businessy things. And there's probably not a lot of advantage for you to actually do client-side rendering. 
Um, just like antiseptics were a good idea back in Victorian era medicine, I think there are some good ideas that we know about today that are going to continue to be good ideas in the future. I think static site generators are a good idea. For those that don't know, um, one of the most popular is called Jekyll. It's actually what runs GitHub pages. Um, and in my mind, there are so many applications for these things. If you have documentation that you need to write, if you have a blog that you need to make, um, you can statically generate the HTML uh, ahead of time and then just deploy it on any simple old web server. Nginx will do, right? You're just, you're just sending static files down the wire. It doesn't mean you can't use JavaScript. Um, the marketing site for Track.js, the documentation site for Track.js, are all built with Jekyll, but they actually do have JavaScript interactivity as well. It's just that we don't have to think about it. We just submit the code to GitHub, they do the build, and then they host it for us, right? It's great. Um, server rendered templates are still a good idea, all right? We've been doing server rendering for a really long time. We're pretty good at it. And it's actually not the end of the world if you actually have to make a full request and response, all right? It might not be as flashy, it might not be as app-like or web 3.0, but it will work, and it will work every time, and browsers are really, really good at the request response model. Um, so something like a simple server rendered template is probably good enough for a lot of applications, especially internal applications, where you don't need some of the fanciness. But maybe you do want the fanciness, right? Maybe you do want that kind of Ajax load business, but without all the client-side headache. Um, one good idea, and this is probably my favorite idea, actually, if you guys look up anything from this talk, I think PJAX is probably the most interesting thing if you haven't heard of it. Um, it was written by Chris Wanstroth, who is the CEO of GitHub, actually, and it's how GitHub does their rendering. So GitHub actually renders almost all their content on the server, but they AJAX it in. And it's not like they're sending JSON. So this is actually a picture from um, just you know, Chrome DevTools, and this is me clicking on a link of the PJAX repository. And you'll actually see they're sending back a big HTML chunk. And browsers are really, really good at dealing with big HTML chunks, all right? It's a lot more work for them to take a JSON blob, parse it, spin up the rendering engine, and then do all the DOM manipulation that needs to occur. Um, Track.js actually uses this method. I thought this was such a good idea that I stole it for our site. And we actually have one of the more responsive app-like feels um, of a website that I've used. YouTube does something similar. They rolled their own. It's not, it's not something that you can just go get online at GitHub, but they're using a similar idea. They're actually sending back JSON um, which in my mind kind of loses some of the appeal, but you can see that they're actually putting HTML in their JSON responses, which is kind of cool. So let's say you don't believe me, and let's say you're like, okay, I can't server render, right? I've got to do this whole client-side shooting match. You have a whole bunch more decisions that you need to make now. The first of which is which package manager to use, right? Because you said, well, server rendering is not going to work. I've got to do this JavaScript thing. Well. You have a lot of options when it comes to package managers, believe it or not. Um, and like medicine of old, there, were some, there are some bad ideas, right? So just like leeches turned out to not be a super smart idea to solve health problems, it turns out Bauer actually isn't a super good idea to solve static file issues. Now, you, you might say, well, Bauer's cool. It was made by the guys that wrote Bootstrap, and it's like, you know, I think some Twitter dudes were involved with it. It's got some cachet. Well, the problem with Bauer this is actually a, an example of a bower.json file. For those that are familiar with package JSONs, it looks almost identical to npm's package.json. And in fact, it is, and it's supposed to be. So the guys that built Bower thought, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had an npm-like thing, but for front-end JavaScript files? So they said, let's just, let's just kind of duplicate the idea uh, behind npm. And at first, that maybe seemed like a good idea, until you actually see how you include a Bower, a Bower file. So this, with no other work, this is how you actually put a Bower component on your page. You link to it just like you did before, right? There's no advancement here. In fact, if you want to bundle or minify a Bower components directory, you get to choose from one of these, like, nine different options that can help you. These tools aren't supported by Bower. They're supported by the open source community, right? in various shades of maintenance mode or activity, and you've got to kind of put all these pieces together yourself. So in my opinion, Bower does not really give you a lot of advantages, and in fact, you don't see a lot of people doing a lot of Bower anymore. Another bad idea, in my opinion, is System.js, also known as JSPM.io, right? So the JSPM guys are pretty funny. 
And they're like, well, we've got Bower, and we've got NPM, and we've got like file systems. So we've got like these three different places that your packages are going to come from. So we should probably make a fourth thing that kind of coalesces all of those together, right? So that we can kind of have one place to do that from. But of course, now the problem is everyone knows you have four things that you have to maintain, right? So you can see here, this is uh, Angular 2 uses System.js, of course. And um, so here you can actually see this is the System.js config. And all it's really doing is delegating to NPM. So just like anesthesia was a good idea in the Victorian area of medicine and continues to be a good idea today, NPM is really all you need as far as package management goes. Um, I do want to talk just briefly, though, about, uh, about Yarn. So have you guys heard of Yarn, the thing from Facebook? Um, so Facebook said, okay, NPM has a few failings, right? NPM doesn't, it's not very good at security. It's not very good at checksumming the packages that it pulls to make sure you actually get what you're supposed to get. Uh, it's also not very good at caching. So for anyone who's done a lot of JavaScript stuff, when you do an NPM install, you are like melting your network, right? And if you're on a slow network or like your build machine is doing a bunch of competing builds, like you are saturating that network and just like hammering NPM with requests. So um, the dudes at Facebook came up with a solution called Yarn. I don't want to talk too much about Yarn just because I think it's too new to know whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. But my initial impressions of it are actually fairly positive. I think they solved the issues in kind of a novel way by continuing to use NPM, right? So when you use Yarn, you're not using the Bower repository, right? You're actually using NPM under the covers. The same packages that you're getting from NPM, you're getting from Yarn. I think, though, that Yarn is ultimately maybe going to be a good idea for its time. But the guys at NPM now have said, well, NPM 4 is going to just solve all these problems that Yarn did. So for now, I'm sticking with NPM personally. So once you've decided on your package manager, you need to find a transpiler, right? Some people call these compilers, um, and I call them code amplifiers, right? So the reason the guy is yelling into a megaphone is because to me, transpilers are this really interesting idea where we take some code and then we amplify it into more code. But it's not necessarily going down a level of abstraction like you would with a compiler, right? We're just taking some fancy JavaScript and converting it to JavaScript that a browser can actually run, right? And a lot of times, the, the JavaScript that the browser can actually run is much larger and much more difficult to debug. But transpilers are here to stay. People want to use them. Um, so we've got to talk about them. Just like exorcism was a bad idea 150 years ago, although I guess some people still think it's a good idea, um, CoffeeScript is a bad idea. So I don't know if anybody is doing CoffeeScript. Um, about the only big project that I know of that's still using CoffeeScript is Atom, the Atom text editor. Uh, but it turns out people don't actually want Ruby in their browser, right, for the most part. It also turns out that the language is advancing, and so a lot of the things that made CoffeeScript a good idea four years ago, you don't really need anymore. Fat arrow syntax, um, some of the list comprehensions, those kind of things that are now standard in ES6 um, are things that CoffeeScript was really touting as advantages. It's simply not necessary anymore. Another bad idea, I think, um, are other kind of esoteric languages, right? You're going to see things like Clojure Script. Like, people are actually, like, trying to write web apps with Clojure Script. And I think that's, in my opinion, I think that's a little, a little crazy. If you look at that syntax, that is pretty wild syntax. And unless you are, like, a Clojure genius, that is going to be pretty hard to maintain. And so I guess, you know, the answer in software is always it depends. Is there ever a reason to use Clojure Script? Maybe. Uh, maybe if your team is a bunch of like functional wizards that's been doing you know lists since the 70s, yeah, closure script might make a lot of sense, um, but probably not for your average project. Just like bacteriology was a good idea 150 years ago, it turns out that it wasn't um, you know demons that were actually hurting us; it was bacteria. Um, ES5 Classic is a good idea when it comes to transpilers. You don't even need a transpiler. It's ES5. It's what the browsers speak and understand. And you can actually write pretty expressive apps with just ECMAScript 5. You don't necessarily need all of the fanciness of ES6, or at least I don't. Another idea that I think is pretty solid, and I think is going to stand the test of time, is TypeScript. Um, two years ago when it first came out, or three years ago, whenever it was, I was kind of a little iffy on it. But Microsoft has shown uh, significant support for it. Anders Heilsberg is the one who designed it, and he's pretty good at designing languages, if you like C Sharp and Delphi. Um, and Microsoft is actually putting a lot of support behind the tooling of it as well. And the TypeScript compiler catches all manner of issues, right? So if you guys have done a lot of TypeScript, um, it's, once you get used to it and kind of the discipline of adding those type annotations, it can be a really effective way to work with really big teams too. Um, so I think TypeScript has, has some longevity, and I think that's uh, something that's going to stick around. 
And finally, I have to talk about Babel, because probably everyone in this room, when they think of transpilers, are thinking of Babel, right? And like, what do I need to do to get Babel working? Um, Babel's what does ES6, right? And so Babel, the history of it, actually, it was written by like an 18-year-old kid from Australia, and it was originally called 6 to 5, or 5 to, yeah, 6 to 5 was what it was called. Um, of course, now it's called Babel, and it's got hundreds, if not thousands, of, of contributors. Um, and it has what's, what are called presets. And so when you choose Babel as a transpiler, um, you have to pick a preset. Um, they've got presets for React, ES 2015, ES 2016, ES 2017, latest. Each one of these presets adds more and more features. Uh, the problem with that is a lot of these features are polyfilled. A lot of these features are sort of transpiler magic. Um, and that can result um, in some issues, right? So transpilation can be too much of a good thing. For example, Babel also has this thing called Stage X presets. These are experimental. You'll note, in red, they even tell you, hey, these are subject to change. Um, so use with extreme caution. The problem, of course, is um, I see a lot of companies using Stage Zero Babel presets, right? And it causes them all kinds of issues. The other thing is that transpilation can be slower. So this is pulled from a website called Six Speed, which is on GitHub, and it's a guy that actually looks at the common implementations for various transpilers, and it compares them to the ES5 equivalent. So classes are, you know, depending on your browser and things, up to 23 times, 27 times slower, right? Generators are quite a lot slower. Object assign, in some cases, actually a little faster, but still slower, right? You're taking several penalties when you use some of this transpilation. Normally, it's not a big deal. Normally, it's fast enough, but it's something else to consider, right? Now you've got to think about build tools. So you've got your transpiler, right? So you've picked Babel or you've picked TypeScript or whatever. And you decided you're going to client-side render with, with NPM as your package manager. But how are you going to build all this stuff? How are you going to put it all together? Well, there are a lot of bad ideas. Radium water was a bad idea 150 years ago. It turns out that putting radioactive water into your body didn't actually help anything. Just like all of these things are bad ideas, each one of these I don't even know the names of some of these. There's like the one on the bottom left looks like a PlayStation controller layout or something. And then I don't I think one's like Turkey or something. These are all actually supported things for Babel. So if you go to the Babel setup page, um, start, I think it's Broccoli JS, like Brunch is the one in the bottom middle. These are all supported build tools. Don't use any of these, okay? They're super esoteric, they're super niche, and you're going to run into so many problems if you try and use something like this. There are some other big name build tools that I also think are bad ideas today. I think Grunt is an outdated idea. I think it was a pretty good idea when it first came out, and I think people needed task runners. Um, when you want to do your minification step, when you want to run your unit tests, when you want to do your you know, whatever, um, you kind of need a task when you're, when you're publishing to uh, Artifactory or something because you have a Java shop, and so everything needs to be like Mavenified. Um, Grunt could do those things for you. The problem with Grunt, I think, was that it was too configuration-based. So you had this big JSON file with all of this sort of magic configuration, and it wasn't very extensible, right? If, if, if the plugin that you used for Grunt didn't do the thing you wanted it to do, you were stuck. You'd have to write your own task, or you'd have to, like, hopefully that there, maybe there was some kind of new version that was alpha that you could use. Um, so it wasn't terribly extensible. Another outdated idea was, was Browserify. But it was a really good idea. Um, basically, the guys that wrote Browserify said, hey, we really like the idea of common JS modules, right? I want to write modules with require statements just like I do in Node. So they're sort of synchronous requiring statements. But I also know that I want to bundle and I want to minify and I want to do all these things. What if we just put them all together? What if I just pointed a tool at a file that used common JS style modules and it just kind of walked that tree and built me a single output? And so that's what Browserify did and it was awesome. Um, but again, it has been supplanted by something else. So just like hospitals were a good idea, in the medicine world. Task runners are still a good idea in the JavaScript world. Now, I happen to like Gulp. There are a lot of people that don't think Gulp is very cool or interesting. In my mind, Gulp just kind of works. It stays out of your way. It's easy to write tasks. The ecosystem is huge, and it's super simple. Um, if, something, if, a, if a task doesn't work quite the way you want it to, it's generally easier to fix or to extend on your own. And it's kind of got an interesting paradigm with source and destination type pipelining capabilities. So I think Gulp is still pretty cool. Um, and I think Webpack is pretty cool. And I think Webpack is the thing that kind of put the nail in Browserify's coffin. So Webpack kind of does everything that Browserify does, plus a few extra things. 
And uh, it does it really fast. And it's got a lot of mind share, and it's got a lot of people working on it right now. And um, while there is some configuration pain to Webpack, I think that you know, if I was choosing to start a new stack and go all in on this client side stuff, I would definitely use Webpack. Uh, and you can use it in combination with Gulp quite easily. It's got a great programmatic model in terms of kicking off Webpack, getting the results, all those kinds of things. Another good idea um, is plain old NPM scripts. So NPM actually gives you this, this block in your package JSON where you can say, in this case, you know, NPM run Webpack or NPM run server. You can just put bash commands in there, right? And that works pretty good. Um, most people are pretty familiar with whatever shell that they're using, and um, it works pretty reliably. It's not great if you have a really complicated uh, set of build processes, but it works really, really good for simple things. Um, so I think NPM scripts is also worth a look. But it's JavaScript, so now you've got your, your transpiler and you've got your build tool, but you've got to deal with async. Um, and this is actually a picture of nsync, because uh, I couldn't think of a good idea for async pictures. Um, but how do you... How do you manage async in JavaScript, right? It's kind of this necessary cost. So just like bloodletting was a bad idea 150 years ago, right? It turns out that just when someone's sick, you don't want to take all the blood out of their body. Callbacks actually weren't a great idea either. So JavaScript said, well, we don't have threads. So everything's going to need, everything that's asynchronous is going to need to be done via callback because we don't want to block the one thread that we do have. And so Node actually bought fully in on callbacks, right? The problem with callbacks is that you can get what's called the callback Christmas tree, right? And so this is, you've got nested callbacks, right? And this gets very, very complicated to maintain. So I think people kind of realize, like, hey, this isn't a great idea. So other ideas were tried. Um, one of the ideas that people seem to like right now is RxJS. Has anybody done any reactive extensions async work? Did you, did you like it? It's okay. So the RxJS premise it sort of like inverts things. It's sort of good for stream processing, right? Imagine you have a stream of events coming in. RxJS gives you a whole lot of ideas on how to like process that stream and manipulate it. The argument for why you should use it in UI apps is that a UI, the argument goes, is just really a series of user input stream events, right? So as the user's clicking and typing, those are just a stream of events that you should process. I actually don't buy that argument personally. I think that's a little bit too simplified, um, and I don't think the paradigm quite works. I think, actually, the reason RxJS is currently super popular is because Netflix uses it. And Netflix said, we use this for our async, and like, look at how cool we are because we're Netflix. Um, which I think is interesting because, actually, have you guys used Netflix UI before? Uh, it's, it's not very good. They redo it all the time. Um, it's kind of like your classic master details UI. Like, you'd think that this would take about five guys about one month to build, and yet they have a whole, like, army of engineers working on this stuff. Um, so I'm not sure that Netflix endorsement is super compelling to me uh, personally. Another idea that we see for async these days is generators. So a lot of people said, okay, maybe RxJS isn't right, but JavaScript now has generators, which are very similar to, um, like in C-sharp, if you guys ever use the yield keyword, uh, it's very, very similar to that. Generators are actually pretty good for async for small things, um, but there's a whole bunch of frameworks now that have come out that are using generators kind of everywhere, right? It's kind of like beating you over the head with these things. Um, one very popular web framework on the Node side of the world was called Koa, right? It's like, we're gonna use generators for every single thing. Um, and it turns out that generators are good sometimes in small doses, but they can actually be very, very painful to debug. Um, and generator support actually isn't like 100% in the language. Like, it, there are some weird edge cases and bugs. Um, so you do still see generators being used quite a lot, uh, but it's another idea that I think is going to not stand the test of time. I think it's going to be proven to be a bad idea because I think there are new things coming that will supplant it. So empirical research turned out to be a good idea, actually applying some rigor to like sort of medicine problems turned out to be a good idea 150 years ago. It has stood the test of time. I think native promises are going to do the same thing. Um, so jQuery sort of put promises on the map with deferreds when it came out, you know, I don't know how many years ago, four or five years ago. Um, promises are now standard in ES5, actually, I think, um, but six for sure. And so almost all browsers support promises natively, and if they don't, there are tons of polyfill libraries for promises. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time about promises because I think you guys probably already know it pretty well. Um, but I think the really interesting thing that's coming is async await. So I don't know if they copied C-sharp exactly, but 
um, the syntax looks awfully similar to how you write async await in C sharp. And the cool thing is, um, just like in C sharp, um, they handle, so ultimately you're dealing in promises still, right? So promises are still the currency of async await. But there's a lot of like sort of syntactic sugar here to unwrap those promises for you. You don't need to think about it. And the best part is, error handling is one of the pain points with promises, right? If you forget to put a dot catch on your promise chain, those errors are just going to get swallowed. But you can use regular try catch semantics with async await once it's available. The, re the reason I say it's a good idea eventually is because right now you have to use Babel for the most part. There's a couple of, uh, there's a, like V8 has it, right? V8, like modern V8. Like if you're in Node, you can actually use async await, I think as far as, uh, as Node 7. But on any sort of browser that's mainstream, you're polyfilling. And I don't know if anybody knows, but do you know how they implement async await with Babel? They actually use generators under the cover. So when you actually try and debug your async await, you're actually looking at this big, nasty generator state machine, right? And so it can actually be really, really complicated to debug this stuff. But the language is moving fast, and the engine, like the, you know, the JavaScript VM guys are, uh, are really pushing this stuff. So I think that sooner rather than later, we're going to see async await as like an actual first-class citizen. So now let's talk about frameworks. So you've picked all of these different paradigms and things that you're going to use. Now you want to make sure you pick the right framework. And there are literally, I don't know, hundreds of frameworks. And so I don't want to talk about all of them today, but I do want to talk about a few of the big ones. Um, so back in the day, they used to use heroin as medicine. They thought this might be a good idea um, on how to like, you know, maybe cure pain of various kinds. And, and actually, it was quite effective at that. Um, it just killed people, too. Um, and so again, we've got Angular, right? So I keep coming back to, coming back to Angular. Um, I won't spend too much time on it because we talked about it a little bit at the beginning. But the Angular guys, um, in my opinion, are kind of rewriting like J2EE. So if you've done any like Angular 2 stuff, a lot of it might feel like Spring was like back in the day, right? Um, there's a lot of setup, a huge learning curve. It's a lot of work to get anything sort of on the page. And one thing that I think is worth, worth talking about is... Um, these complicated frameworks, they're not going to get easier as the application increases in size, right? So a lot of people will say, well, it's complicated now because the example is really simple. But once you get this really big app, then you're good to go. The thing is, I don't actually believe that. I don't, how many times have you seen a complicated thing get m like way better once you added about 10,000 lines of code to it, right? It doesn't happen a lot. Um, so I think that's the mistake the Angular guys are making. And... Um, because they're sort of Google, they've got a lot of clout, they can really push this thing. But I think Angular is pretty dangerous. I think Meteor is a bad idea. So I don't know if anybody here has used Meteor. But the premise behind Meteor was that you don't actually need to care if you're on the server or the client. You can just kind of write your code, and Meteor will marshal that data for you, and everything will just work. Um, has anyone used .NET Remoting or DCOM? Uh, they, too, have the same premise, right? Of, like, don't worry about the network boundary, right? CSLA, if you've used that framework. Um, you don't need to worry about it, e except for you do, right? I mean, like, you can't just pretend that this network doesn't exist, right? And so on TrackJS, we've seen all kinds of issues that people have with Meteor. Um, and we've had to do a whole bunch of support for customers where it wasn't anything related to us. It was just that Meteor is so diabolically magical that no one can figure out what's going on with it uh, when it breaks. So I think that Meteor is one of those things that you, you want to stay pretty far away from. I think another bad idea is, uh, is Polymer or web components. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have heard of this one either, but this is a kind of a standard that was pushed unilaterally by Google. So Google said, we think this is a great idea. They started it on the standards track. Mozilla said, hey, we think this is actually kind of a bad idea. And Google said, we don't care. We're putting it in Chrome. It's out there. So today, in Chrome, you can actually use web components. And what does that mean? Well, you've got things like the Shadow DOM, right? So they said, well, I want to be able to style my component, and I don't want to let anyone else style my component with cascading style sheets. So they give you this thing called the Shadow DOM, and there's shadow roots for your CSS classes to, like, attach to. And it turns out they weren't really solving problems that anyone normal had. Um, and the other problem with web components is you build this component, and that's great. But the problem with all of these components, really, Angular 2 as well, because they're like super huge on these components. A lot of times on my website, I've got two components that need to know about 
changes in one or the other, right? Like, so if I update my cart in a shopping cart, I need to update the price as well. And so those are two different components. Web components, Angular 2, they don't really give you any good tools to deal with that. So usually you end up seeing like an event bus, right, where you're just like firing these, these you know, string-based events. Um, or, in, you know, in Angular 2's case, you get this kind of weird dependency injection thing that works most of the time. Um, but they didn't really solve the core issue of how do these components communicate with each other. Um, another kind of idea that I don't think is a bad idea, I think Ember will continue to stay around, um, but there's some things to be weary of with Ember. So if you haven't used Ember and you're thinking about starting a project with Ember, um, the thing that you should remember is that those guys have changed how they do things about four times, like significantly. And so I've actually helped on a number of Ember upgrade projects where like when you wanted to move from one major version of Ember to another, um, or even like minor versions, they would have significantly changed how things work. They changed their rendering engine midway through and kind of copied the same ideas as React with this thing called Glimmer that they built. So I think you want to be really careful if you pick Ember because you don't really, I don't personally have confidence in their commitment to backwards compatibility. Um, also, the dudes that run Ember are kind of, um, I would say a little bit academic. Um, they'll kind of do the right thing academically, whether it's sort of the pragmatic choice or not. Um, so I would definitely be a little bit careful of those guys. Penicillin was a pretty good idea. I don't think it was 150 years ago. I think it's uh, newer than that. But it was one of those things that people were like, this is a great idea. And uh, if you ask me what framework I would choose, I would choose React and Redux. And I know that's, like kind, of, that's kind of the party line at this point, right? Everybody likes React and Redux. Like, that's super cool. Um, but I've been doing React now for about two years, and I think... As far as the client-side rendering world of SPAs goes, I think it has kind of the best of both worlds. So it's got, it has a solution for when your different components need to be aware of each other, right? Redux is basically a global state bag. So when something changes one place, that state is actually plumbed through to all of the other places that need it. The other thing that React does that I think is really useful is, uh, is one-way data flow, right? There's been a lot of talk about that and how cool that is. But I think, it's, I think it's deserved. I think that you know, Angular 2, um, Knockout, um, several other frameworks, Ember, they do a lot of two-way data binding, right? And a lot of people really like MVVM or two-way data binding. And I think it's a really great solution for small things. But I've worked on a lot of MVVM apps where just maintaining that app as things get more and more complicated, as the business adds more and more requirements, it's actually very, very difficult uh, because you don't really know, you know, somebody sets some data over here, which causes a cascade over here. And so these things are sort of two-way changing all of the time. And I think the one-way data flow actually solves a lot of those debugging and maintenance issues. The other reason I like React is uh, they've kind of got all this boilerplate figured out for you. So you can just ignore most of the crap I just said, and you can just download this thing called Create React App. So it's on GitHub. And... Uh, they have basically come out with their sort of opinionated version of like, here's the settings that you should use to use a React app. You can either use this as a boilerplate on your own, so you can just like spin it up and it's good, or um, you can type npm eject um, or create React app eject, and it will actually spit out all of the configuration files that it's using internally. So if you kind of like most of what it chooses for you, um, you can actually kind of get those raw files and then tweak them for your app. Uh, this to me is a, a pretty huge game changer because I've been doing this JavaScript stuff for, for so long that a lot of this tooling and stuff doesn't really bother me and it kind of makes sense at some point. But I gotta tell you, if you're new to this stuff, there is so many things to think about just to get Hello World on the page, right? And, and, and just to get any kind of value from this. So I think this is a huge win. And some people are probably saying, well, what about Vue? What about Aurelia? What about Inferno? What about Intercooler? What about Preact? Um, I explicitly chose not to include these frameworks right now because I actually don't have enough of an opinion about them, right? But to talk about them briefly, I think Vue is going to be pretty interesting. I think Vue is going to supplant Angular 2, possibly. Um, it's got that two-way data binding that people seem to enjoy, but without all of the ceremony. Um, Aurelia is another two-way data binding thing. It was written by a guy named Rob Eisenberg, who did Durandal, if you remember that. Um, but they took a pretty pragmatic approach to a lot of this stuff, too. There's not a lot of ceremony in getting an Aurelia app up and going. I think it's kind of an interesting framework. Inferno and Preact are, are sort of interesting. They're sort of React clones isn't the right word, but they aim to be API compatible. And so they take some kind of different techniques, but 
their whole premise is that they're going to be very, very fast versions of React. And so if you've written your app in React and now you, want, you have some speed issues, say, you can just drop these guys in and it'll work. Now, I don't know if that's true. You can almost never just drop anything in and have it work. Um, Intercooler is also pretty cool. It's kind of like a PJAX framework. Uh, it's so it's more for server-side rendering. It's pretty neat. Um, again, it's, it's been around for a while, but there's not been a lot of uptake. But I think that you're going to start seeing more intercooler uptake in the future as well. So what's the bottom line? What's the, what's the, whole, what's the whole point of this? Well, I guess my main point today of like even talking about all this stuff, because it's, I mean, really, it's a lot of stuff to consider when you're talking about building a web app. Um, I guess my main point is that we're making web apps too complicated, all right? Um, it used to be that you could just take a notepad, XE, double click it, make a, you know, index.html, put some angle brackets on a page, FTP it somewhere, and you're off to the races, right? Um, and I think we've lost that a little bit. And I think that we're finding that all of these abstractions that we've created, all these complexities that we've put in there, they're not really helping us, right? Are they, are they helping us get our apps out faster? Do they deliver client value faster? Um, and I don't know that they do. Client rendering has a significant cost. So I hope that everyone realizes that if you choose to go down the single page application route, there's a whole bunch of things that you're going to encounter that aren't going to work like you thought they were. Like something as simple as the back button, right? Like in a server rendered world, the back button always works. It's great. In a single page application world, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Unless you do specific things to handle it, you might not have a working back button, right? Um, there's also all of this tooling. There's all of this churn in terms of uh, JavaScript language, right? And so you're actually like on this upgrade treadmill whether you like it or not. Uh, and the browsers are constantly shifting things out from under you. Like Chrome in particular has broken a number of things that are pretty critical. Um, a lot of people are using source maps, right? So a source map is basically, hey, I've, I've transpiled my code uh, but I don't, like, I don't really want to see the output. When I debug in Chrome, I want to see the original source input, and so you can use source maps for that. The problem is Chrome breaks that sometimes. So there's various flavors of source map generation, and uh, for a while, the source maps that Webpack generated just didn't work in Chrome. For a whole major release of Chrome, it just didn't work. Um, so you're going to have some pain, potentially, with this stuff. Um, the tool chain is improving rapidly, so, so things are getting better, right? I don't want to say it's all crap, but a lot of it's crap. Um, and so you should be skeptical of new fads, right? Like, I don't think anybody thought asthma cigarettes is a good idea anymore, right? It turns out that probably wasn't, like, super, super good for you. Um, at the end of the day, I guess it, we're, we're putting angle brackets on a page, okay? We're not, we're not actually curing cancer. This isn't something that's supposed to take 108 megabytes of node modules. It's not supposed to take 13,000 files to put an H1 on the page, right? Um, so yeah, so that's it. That's the, that's it.